Good evening. Hello. <laughs> do you like we do with the kids in Good News Club? So we had, um, we had a, a group called uh, Neighborhood Bible Time. I don't know if you've read Neighborhood Bible Time. Was that the name of it? Yeah, Neighborhood Bible Time. It was a group out of Colorado. And they would do um, vacation Bible school. And they'd send these two preacher boys in to do your groups for you. And uh, one, one year, to get the kids' attention, they would be talking, and they would feel like the kids were talking over them and everything, so they would go, eyeballs, and they would go, click, and they, it meant to close your mouth and look at me, so eyeballs. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for the day. Um, you are good to us, and we thank you for your love and your grace. Um, Lord, I thank you that, um, Father, you are... <laughs> You are a God who has given us uh, so much, um, especially given us the greatest gift of all when you gave us your son so that we can come to know you and have eternal life and live forever with you. And uh, um, Father, I just pray that now uh, you would bless our time together. Um, Father, that you would be honored and glorified with this. And thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so grab your prayer sheets. Look, look at our prayer sheets. First one I want to I want to make mention of is Bill Jeffers. Uh, Bill was feeling like he was having a heart attack this morning, so they took him to the emergency room. Uh, they are saying that it was a a mild heart attack, um, and their uh, reports are that they're going to take him to CAMC Memorial when they get a bed for him, and possibly put a stint in um, tomorrow or the next day. So be in prayer for 95-year-old Bill Jeffers. Um, the second one I, wanna, I want you to be in prayer for is Ida. Um, Ida is going through some depression. Um, I mean, feeling depressed and demon, demons up, up, upon her and all sorts of things. So she's going through a lot right now. Um, so be in prayer with her. She's uh, actually staying at her son Dewey's house instead of at her house. Um, so be in prayer for her. Um, so those two, those two people. Okay. Um, what else? RJ. So pray for the Maynard family, but not not John and Danielle. Okay. Yeah. Are there any more sheets? Are you related to the pastor? <laughs> All right. Yes.
Doss. Yes, with Boss with the D. The new baby. Do you know the baby's name? Mallory. Okay. Okay. We had uh, had my cousin on the station for a long time, Sean Craig. Mm-hmm. Tom Taylor. Praising the Lord that Fred's not pregnant. <laughs> Jeremiah 36 says, Ask now and see whether a man is ever in labor with child. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> yes. Surely what? Shirley Lewis. Let's try this side, Melanie. David slept for two nights in a row. Nice. How much duct tape did you use? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Good. Teresa. Yeah. All right. Good, good. Um, her sister, Karen Hoosier. 
Yes. On our list is Sam Schaefer. That's Quinn's girlfriend's dad who passed away. His memorial service is this Saturday at 1. So be in prayer for that. Um, Quinn and his girlfriend will be coming home. Or are they home? Tomorrow. Coming home tomorrow. Tomorrow. Friday. One of those days that ends in day. Um, so be in prayer for them for that. Anything else? Bill's on his way home. prayer for Bill and Laura um, in that whole situation All right. anything else our country yes okay what's her name know that you did it yeah well the only the, the the only the only one that knows will be me because i i'm the one that gives it to kelly so yeah oh okay I always thought that's where she was hitting on you. Um, uh, pray for our kids. School time. Whether they're homeschooled, whether they're public school, whether they're private school, or whatever. That our kids need to pray. Amen. <clears throat> what was that statistic you told me last night about suicide? Yeah, last year was the largest amount of suicides ever in the United States. Um, yeah, being shut in has done just everybody. Being shut in has done a number to our country. Yeah, they're talking about doing it again. Yeah. There's a lot... Uh, our country has sold its soul to Satan, um, and they gave it. <coughs> and, um, n yeah, so there's too much to get into tonight. All right. <laughs> That's right. Just be about the Father's business and pray for Jesus' return any day now. So, yeah. How's your piano? Okay. 
All right, let's go ahead and pray silently, and uh, I'll close in a few moments. And again, Father, we praise you for this night. We praise you for the opportunity to get together in the middle of the week to study your word. Um, Father, I pray that you will um, just encourage us through the word. Uh, help us, Lord, to be faithful to you and to you to it. Um, Lord, I just thank you for um, the, the opportunities that you give to us to just praise you. Um, we praise you for the, the good report on uh, Teresa's sister and um, Lord for um, just your protection over um, other people who have had um, illnesses and problems and, and Lord we just see you at work in people's life and Lord I know our world's a mess I know our country's a mess but Lord I know who has the answer and it is you um, you are the answer to all of our problems Lord I pray that there would be a turning to you and, uh, Father, I just thank you for that. Thank you for all you do. Help us, Lord, to be faithful to you um, through all things, Lord. May our eyes be on the one who gave his life for us and uh, the love that he has for us, Lord. And, and, Lord, I thank you for that. Pray, Father, for um, the many requests that we've had uh, today, uh, Bill uh, Jeffers, and just uh, pray for healing for him and, um, Lord, for your your, your hand upon him that you would strengthen him uh, father for um, Ida as she's going through discouragement and depression and uh, feeling weight of, uh, of demons on her Lord and I, I just pray for Lord that God you would just surround her with your love and um, Lord that she would be uh, daily searching scripture and being in scripture Lord um, Lord, I thank you for that. I pray for um, Terry uh, Hackney as she's uh, fallen and broken her foot. Pray for uh, healing. I pray. I just praise you. It's not any worse, um, and that Lord, there's no surgery, but just for complete healing for that. For uh, Heather's mom Shirley, who's going through and having high blood pressure, that she would take her medication correctly. And uh, Father, for um, Fred's uh, cousin Tom, who 
uh, is in the hospital, had some surgery, and just pray for healing on him, and um, just for that the whole family as they've lost the loved one, and going through a lot right now, Lord, we thank you for what you're doing. We pray for the Maynard family who lost the, a loved one, and um, in, in for Cowman as he's um, watching out for this young uh, girl, uh, Lord, I just pray that you would just give him a, a heart of of grace and mercy and, and comfort, Lord. Um, he would understand, um, and Lord, I thank you for them. Uh, for um, for Ashley Sellers, who's having a baby, Lord, we pray for um, a healthy delivery, and uh, then, Lord, we thank you for Whitney Doss, and we pray for this little baby and for her, um, for Mallory, and for Whitney for healing. Um, Lord, we pray that your strength would be upon them. For, um, for Quinn and, and Maddie as they're traveling and coming home for this memorial on Saturday, we pray that you would be in the midst of that and that there would be comfort and healing and encouragement. And uh, through it all, may you be praised, Lord. We give you the praise for all you do in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. All right, grab your Bibles. <clears throat> We're going to um, begin where we began last week, and I'm just going to real quick hit those three things. I'm going to finish up tonight on um, the five reasons I don't believe in Calvinism. Um, this is this is not a message I like to preach. Um, I like to preach truth, and when I preach truth, hopefully it goes into our heads and we get it in our hearts and we understand it. Um, but in tw Matthew 24, Jesus again, I want to remind us what Jesus said as, as we started here. Um, in Matthew 24, 3, he says, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, says, uh, telling, uh, tell us, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one does what? Deceives you. All right? For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And in the last days, and the last days began in John's age. When John was writing, they, the last days were beginning. He was already seeing deception within the church and within the world, and it's still out there today. It's very prevalent in our world today, um, and we see it throughout uh, church history. It's there. Um, and Jesus said, uh, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, okay? Um, and that includes any bondage. And so if you're having difficulties, if you're wondering if something is true or not, read it in Scripture. And if it's there once, make sure it's there twice. If it's there once and it's not there twice, it's probably not correct, all right? And if it's not, if it's out of Scripture, then then uh, it's probably not right. So be careful with what you do. So here's point one that they come up with um, that, that Calvinists believe is total depravity. We looked at this last week in depth. We're not going to do that today. Um, if you haven't heard it, then go out on, on our, our uh, web page and you can listen to last week's message um, and listen to the geek that was preaching then. Um, <clears throat> total depravity, we are completely unable and unwilling to recognize uh, the truth without God drawing us. Um, and they get that conclusion from John 44. Um, and uh, in Jesus' words, um, their belief in that is that man is born in hatred to God. Man is born in hatred to God um, and can do nothing to change that. Can do nothing to change that. Um, that God will pick and choose who's saved, who will not be saved. Um, and, and so we, we talked about all of that, right? I'm not going to go into details on that, but uh, <clears throat> the, the main thing we is, is that we understand we have always had a choice to obey or disobey God. Question? TULIP is what it stands for. The five points of Calvin is, is TULIP. Total, de yeah, it's total depravity. We'll, you'll get with it when, you'll see it when we get down done, because each, each one's... T-U-L-I-P. Okay, so, um, no. I've corrected it. Thank you very much. Where? What? Huh. Uh 
I'm going home. <laughs> Wait a minute. You know, I usually say I don't have to take this. I don't have to take this abuse. I, I can get it at home. Um, it's the King's English. It's the King's English. There you go. <laughs> We've always had a choice. Always had a choice to obey or disobey God. Okay, Adam and Eve, right? They had a choice. Um, that ability to choose is consistent with God's character in the Old and the New Testament. Listen, God's not afraid of us choosing, all right? That's, he doesn't make us robots. I'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. <clears throat> the you under the tulip is unconditional election. Unconditional election. Uh, this is the idea that we cannot do anything to be saved since God is so sovereign that if it was predestined, or the words they use now is not so much predestined, it's predetermined or determined to happen, it will happen, all right? And I use the illustration um, that if I took my coffee and dumped it all over Carrington's head, it's not my fault because it was already determined by God that that was going to happen. So she can't be mad at me. She has to be mad at God because God had determined it. Um, and so <clears throat> we came to the, the conclusion that faith is the condition for salvation based on what the Bible tells us in more than one place. <clears throat> then we looked at, as we close, limited atonement. Limited atonement, which I said was probably the most heretical, heretical um, part of Calvinism, and it's the idea that Jesus did not die for everyone, just those who were elected or predetermined, predestined, pre-saved, however you want to say it. And then I fixed this one because I made a mistake in it last week. I won't fix the other ones because we won't be going back to this. So, But uh, I fixed it so it's different. So a limited atonement is a false doctrine that what Jesus did on the cross is made available only to those who believes. I did take the S off, believe. I did take it off, but I didn't save it. The second point there is salvation is a free gift to all men access through faith. God does not want anyone to perish. He doesn't want anyone to perish. And there's a bunch of scripture that I gave you last week that I won't give you this week uh, as much. All right, so um, this next one, I, anybody know what it is before I, Charlie puts it up there? Oh, Charlie already put it up there. Irresistible grace, all right? Irresistible grace, and this is what they say it is. Uh, those who are truly saved, those who are predetermined, predestined, will not be able to resist the grace, the salvation of God. Okay? Um, and that goes back into whether or not we have our own free will and the ability to make our own decisions. Do we have our own free will and the, the ability to make our decisions or not? Most Calvinists would argue from here that they are on the same page with non-Calvinists and will try to get you to argue that the issue here is really about God's sovereignty as they understand God's sovereignty, right? I believe God is sovereign. I do. I believe he's sovereign over everything except for man. He gives us the opportunity to, to choose whether or not we want to do it. Here's a, what? He's still sovereign. Right? Um, it's like he's the king, okay? So he's the king of, and, and we talked about this yesterday. If, if Jesus knew that, uh, yes, last week, if Jesus knew that, um, that mankind was going to be under his, his, his rule and, and was going to do exactly what he told him to do or not do, then why in the world did Jesus say, pray like this? And he said, one of the things that he said was that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why would he tell us to pray that way if we were all going to be doing his will anyway? So, um, here's the simple grace that, forced, uh, is it, that is forced onto us instead of being offered as a free gift. So, the, the key to remember here is that Salvation is a free gift. It is received through what? 
through faith and accessed by grace, meaning grace is also a gift. So if we know God's character, we know that he wouldn't give us a gift by forcing us to accept it. Okay? It's, uh, it, it's like, you know, I, I have a gift up here for you, and you don't, have a cho- you don't have a choice. I'm going to make you take it. You have to have it. Well, you, you know, you, you don't want that Michigan T-shirt. Too bad. You have to take it, and you have to not only take it, but you have to wear it every Saturday because that's the only way they can win. No, I'm just kidding. Um, let, me, let me give you two examples on here. Write this verse down. Um, it, we're not going to look at it up there, but you can write it in your, in your little notebooks. Matthew 7, 7 through 12. <clears throat> Matthew 7, 7 through 12. And Luke 11, 9 through 13, Charlie. Luke 11, 9 through 13. It's, it's going to be up here um, on the PowerPoint. Listen, God doesn't want us to be robots. He wants us to worship him willingly. Okay? Um, and so 11, 9 through 13 and Matthew 7, 7 through 12 are basically the same thing, okay? Um, and so Jesus is speaking. He says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be open." If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? What's the answer to that? No. If cowmen ask you for a fish, are you going to give him a serpent? No, you're going to give him a fish. Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who do what? All right. So another thing to keep in mind is that the theme of both of those passages in Scripture explain the gifts that God is willing to give those who ask in faith. Who ask in faith. And and that's that's the fact that, the, that you, you you need to request you need to ask um, you have to choose to ask God for things that are on your heart and as we've already discussed you have to choose faith it's a choice right so what does any of that mean or have to do with irresistible grace well the passages show that we must choose to ask for things on our hearts meaning we have the ability to not ask at the same time. So the story is told about uh, a man who passes away and uh, goes into heaven, and um, he goes into one room, and he sees this room full of treasures and good things, and he says, what's this room for? And uh, the angel says to him, "This this is the room that God has that he wants to give to all the saints, but they've never asked for it. Now, here's some verses that support this idea that we have the ability, um, because one of the things that irresistible teaches, irresistible grace, is, is that we cannot harden our hearts, that when God calls us, we have to accept him. We can't harden our hearts. Proverbs 29, 1 says, He who is often rebuked and hardens his neck will suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Um, Acts 7, verse 51. Acts 7, verse 51 says, um, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always... All, now, he's talking to the Jewish leaders, and he's calling them, You stiff-necked, you, you uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Um, if you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28, the uh, last chapter uh, of the book of Acts. Paul is writing in here and, and um, talking about 
uh, people, especially the Jewish people. Um, <clears throat> so when they did not agree among themselves, verse 25, they departed after Paul and said one word. The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah the prophet to our fathers, saying, Go to this people and say, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. Why? For the hearts of this people have grown dull. They weren't born dull. They, were, they have grown dull. Um, the, their ears have become hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Did they do that willingly, or was that forced upon them by God? They did it willingly, okay? How many of you know someone who you knew was there, they were under the conviction of Almighty God, and they needed to be saved, and they walked away from it? Right? White knuckled. Yep. Not, not, not going to happen, right? It irresistible grace is not it, it is not possible because the grace of God is not irresistible on what we find in the Bible um, you can you can say no to God you may not like it afterwards especially if you're his child right Jonah found that out I know I found that out Point five, the P in tulip, is perseverance of the saints. So what do they mean by perseverance of the saints? God will regenerate you in such a way that you are going to have all these perfect works, and they don't use the word perfect, they use the word effectual, works until you die. Here's what they're saying. If you're actually elected, you're elected, okay, you're chosen, and then you come to faith, that from that moment that you come to faith after you've been chosen, then, then you uh, have all of these works that you need to do to prove that you were elected. You with me? If you don't live up to the standards of working in this perfection, then you weren't elected. We don't believe that. We believe when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you're saved for when? Till when? Eternity. Eternity. Once saved, how do we say it? Once saved, Always save. Thank you. Um, that, to me, is a false doctrine. Um, it opposes, and it comes with a lot of problems. One is that as long as we have our flesh, as long as we're living here on this earth, we are not going to be sinlessly perfect. Yeah, he didn't have any... But his faith, and then he died, so, yeah. 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 But there are no, no good works to, to take him up there, right? Other than to look at the guy across the, and say, shut up, you're, you're going to die too. <laughs> but he didn't give him a chance to witness to him either, right? So, yeah, no, you're okay. I mean, you're right. I mean, we're not going to be sinless, all right? First John tells us that. First John 1, 8. Go ahead, Charlie, find that one for me, will you? If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 1 John 1, 10. If we say that we have not sin, we make him, make who? Christ to be what? A liar, and his word is not in us. All right? Um, I'm going to give you a bunch of verses here, so get ready to write some of these down. Hebrews 11, 1. Anybody know that one? Oh, try to put it up. He's good. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen, right? So what is our evidence of our faith, of our, of our salvation? Faith, right? I mean, 11-1. Faith is, is the evidence. We 
cannot be saved by our works. It's not a proof of our justification, of our salvation. Okay? We cannot be saved by our works. Galatians 2.16. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by in Jesus Christ. Even if we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by, not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. So works do not prove that somebody is saved. The proof is, do you believe? Do you have faith? Titus 1, 2. Go ahead. In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, before God even made man. He had made a way for man to be redeemed. Uh, and that was through Jesus. That was the, he is the way to eternal life. He sent his only begotten son uh, to die for our sins, to atone for them. What Jesus did on the cross, we did not do. Um, and we cannot do. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In him, you also, excuse me, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Hold up, hold up, go back, go back, go back. Please, please, please. There it is. All right, so one of the things that Calvinists believe is that you are, you are chosen, you figure out you're chosen, and then you come to faith. All right, now look at this verse and tell me how that does not work. I don't know. No, that's a good question. I, I can't answer that. I don't know. I don't know. They know that they come to, they come to faith after that. I don't, I don't know. So, yeah, yeah. So, when, and, and when you come to this verse, you look at it and you say, okay, well you, in him you also trusted. When did you trust? After you heard what? The word. You have to hear the word of truth to come to it. Um, so, that's the gospel of salvation. Okay, Charlie, I'm sorry. You hear by the word of God. Exactly who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So he says we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. Now a lot of them will be, uh, a lot of Calvinists believe that if someone stops going to church or if they fall away that's proof that they were never saved to begin with. It's God who seals us not in our works but it is it's through the Holy Spirit. We, we're saved by the grace of God, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. It's by His grace that He saved us. Yes, sometimes Christians are unfaithful. Sometimes we don't read the Bible as much as we should. Amen or oh me, right? Uh, we, we don't pray enough. We don't do the things that we should be doing all the time, Right? But does that mean we've lost our salvation? Even Paul struggled with that. And I do, and I know I shouldn't be doing those. One of Jesus' favorite disciples denied him, denied knowing him. Is it possible to know Christ and yet deny him? Absolutely. 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 Paul wrote under the inspiration of God to Timothy and said this, uh, 1 Timothy 2.13, write that down. If we believe not yet, he abides faithful because he cannot deny himself. And Thomas doubted. <laughs> I doubt it. We believe by help our unbelief, right? So, <clears throat> and, and the amazing thing is when you read this verse, 2 Timothy 2.13, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. That is written from Paul, a believer, to Timothy, another believer. And he's saying, listen, God cannot lie. 
when God promises something, he's not going to renege on his promise. So if a true brother or sister has a lapse of faith, it doesn't mean that they were never saved. It simply means that they've fallen away from the truth. And the reward may not be as great in heaven. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.13 what does it say about God in there? He's faithful. Keeps his promises. That's, after we receive Christ, the Holy Spirit comes into us. The Holy Spirit seals us. And later on in life, because of circumstances, or because we're listening to something we shouldn't be listening to, we're watching something we shouldn't be watching, we're, 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 we're focusing on the things of the world instead of on Christ, right? And so that person may come along and say, you know, I don't really believe in Jesus anymore. Absolutely. There you go. And so does that mean that person may have not believe really in the first place well possibly maybe they were never saved in the first place but if they're truly indwelt by the holy spirit and they say that they're not long for this world um god says he will take people out of the world for things like that so um we need to be careful first john five thirteen, charlie put that one up for me please these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have what? And that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. That you may know. We can know. I don't want to get into this too much because this is part of Sunday's message. But we can know whether or not we have eternal life. It's not a guessing game. Okay? God's not going to put us out there and say, okay, let's see, if you get this question right on what is eternal life, then you get to go to heaven. If not, sorry, but you have to work a little bit harder. God doesn't do that. He made us a promise. If you believe, you will have eternal life, and you can know that. Amen? It's not a reward. Don't take my thunder for Sunday. <laughs> I usually have seven pages of notes. I have nine and a half. I'm excited. We're finishing First John. You can call for them to deliver it here, but look for those who believe. Look for those who believe in the perseverance of the saints. They can never know if they're truly saved or not. They can never know. And, and the moment they see someone slip up, or they slip up, they begin to doubt their salvation. That is not a way to live. That is not how God wants us to live. Yeah, absolutely. So, they ask the questions, too. You know, am I living the perfect life so I can make it to heaven? That's not what Christ commands us to do. It is. Thank you. The Bible says we can know that we have eternal life. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to guess. The only way we come and have eternal life is by trusting in Christ and the work that he done on the cross that is our faith and our faith then becomes our evidence not our good works we work and do the things like we do why because we're commanded or because we love Jesus because we love Jesus right so our works are not done because we have to but because we love him and glorify him but if we believe the gospel, we believe that Jesus said, He that believes on me has, present tense, everlasting life. 
when did life begin for believers? When did eternal life begin for believers when you get to heaven? No, when you ask him in your heart. Here's another interesting promise, John 10, 28 through 29. And I love, love, love John 28, 10, 28, and 29. Look at this. He says this. This is Jesus, okay? It's important that you remember that. Jesus says this. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of, hold on, Charlie, don't go, out of my hand. Who's talking? Where are you? No, you're not, you're not in God's hand. You're in Jesus' hand. Now, now check this out, verse 29. Jesus says, my father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my So not only are you, if you believe, in Jesus' hand, you are in the Father's hand. You know what that's called? That's called double security. It's called double security. Right? You're in good hands with all, with all Jesus, right? Huh? <laughs> no, one of them would be good enough, but both, right? I mean, the seal of the Holy Spirit? We are. It could be. We're not told that in Scripture. It would be interesting to find out. Uh, Psalm 89, 29 through 34. His seed also I will make to endure forever, and his throne is the day of heaven. This is God talking about Jesus before Jesus becomes man. If his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgments, if they break my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Linda, stripes, not strips, I'm sure. <laughs> Nevertheless, my loving kindness I will not utterly take from him, nor allow my faithfulness to fail. Verse 34, uh, my covenant I will not break nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Even if I don't obey the Father or Jesus Christ and backslide or even reject him like Peter did, I am still in his hand. I still belong to him, but the whipping is coming. It might be. I have the freedom of choice, but not of consequences. All right, the most famous verse in Scripture is John 3, 16. Who said that verse? No, say I did. Jesus did, right? These words came out of Jesus' lips. He was God manifested in the flesh. He doesn't renege on his promise. If you are a child of God, if you are saved, yes, you might get chastised, but he's still your father. He's not going to take away your salvation. He may take away your toys, but you're not condemned. To be punished on earth is completely different than to spend eternity in hell. Thank God if you believe in the gospel, you're not going to die and go to hell. You spend eternity in heaven. And God doesn't expect us to be perfect on earth. That's just ridiculous. He knew that we had this sin nature. So in between... 1 John 1, 8 and 1 John 1, 10. He made sure that John penned these words if we confess our sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If the saints were just going to persevere, why would he have given John that verse to write? And many other warnings about watching out for the evil one. Why does he tell us to put on the whole armor of God and go into battle? Why, why does he tell us that we're overcomers? Right? Exactly. 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 <clears throat> if we're already going. Yep. That's why I don't believe it. It is sad. Hey, look. So, 
men are very prideful. And so God had Paul pen these words in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And Lisa and I have talked about this. We, we know several people that um, are Calvinistic or Calvinists and, and claim to be it. And one of the things we see in them is pride. But I also see that if I'm not careful, that could be me. That my pride could get in the way because I know that I'm biblically correct. I know that I don't deserve salvation. And that's what needs to keep me going, is that I need to have a humble and contrite heart, just as Jesus commanded us to have for salvation. Every morning I need to get up and say, Jesus, I need you. I need you. I, I, I have to have you, right? Um, we, you are declared righteous after salvation, but that does not mean that you're perfect. We are not perfect, so we cannot do perfect works because we're not perfect people. Romans eleven six, And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. In other words, we are we're saved by grace. We're not saved by works. We don't work for our salvation. We work because of our love for our salvation and for our Lord Jesus Christ and to glorify him. John six forty seven. I think this is the last verse I have for you. Um, maybe not. John six forty seven. Um, Most assuredly, I say to you, who he who believes in me has everlasting life. Who has the King James version? Can you look that verse up for me? And one of you, first one, will do a, a sword drill and see who who's got it in the King James. I bet Charlie could get it first. Boom! Nailed it. Verily, verily, I say unto you. He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. And the reason I put that up there is that word hath or has is in the present tense. When you have Jesus, you are saved. You belong to Jesus, once saved, always saved. I'm not looking at my works as proof of my salvation. I'm looking back to the day that I realized that I was a sinner and that I needed a Savior, and I admitted that I was a sinner and asked for his salvation, and that by grace of God, I needed him to help me. I asked for forgiveness of sin, realizing that my sin had put Christ on the cross. It was my free will to make that choice. And in that moment, I received the Holy Spirit, and I received eternal life, and life, eternal life began for me in that moment, and I was born again. Um, this idea of continuing to work for my salvation is not biblical. Um, it, it, make, it really makes the work of Christ of, of no effect. Um, why, if I was elected, do I have to continue to work? And what am I working for? Right. Yeah. And so I have many more problems with this religion, false teaching, this teaching. Um, many of these false beliefs are truly taken out of context. Um, <clears throat> when you're studying something, it's really easy to take things out of context if you're not careful. Um, you, you can say, okay, God, I want to I do your will so show me what your will is today. And you open the Bible and it says, and you put a finger down and you read it and it says, Judas went out and hung himself. <laughs> God, God, that's not my, that's not your will. So you close the Bible, you say, show me again. You go, and you open it and it says, go and do thou likewise. And you're like, no, God, that, that can't be. That's not a way to read the Bible, right? And if you're not careful with, with Calvinism, Calvinism becomes very legalistic. Exactly, and it's real easy to do. Second Corinthians, I told you we were done, but we're not. I'm just kidding. This one's not on, on the screen, so you might want to look it up. Second Corinthians 11. 
<clears throat> we need to keep in mind who our enemy is and what our purpose is. All right? Our enemy is not people. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Our enemy is against the evil one, right? Our battle is, and our purpose is to share the gospel of Jesus, and we need to keep that in mind. So Paul gave a warning that he was concerned that Satan was going after believers the same way that he went after Eve in the beginning, mixing a little bit of truth with a lie. And so let me close with this, what Paul told them in this passage in 2 Corinthians. It's extremely powerful because it outlines how we can define doctrine that comes from the enemy. Laid out as clear as can be, the enemy hides behind half-truths, a little, a little truth, and behind another Jesus that should scare us to death. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The message of Jesus Christ is simple enough that a five-year-old can understand it. But it's also complex enough that a person who's gone through three theology, uh, degree, has three theology degrees still cannot understand God. Paul says, I fear lest someone, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. In other words, you'll accept it. When you think about the faiths, the different religions of this world, this begins to make sense. When you think about how Mormonism teaches that Jesus was a created being who is really our spirit brother that became God, that is not of the Jesus of the Bible. It's not. When Islam teaches that Jesus was just a prophet and a good teacher, but not divine, not of God, that is not the Jesus of the Bible. And that's what Paul is warning against. In the same way, Calvinism teaches a Jesus that did not come to save all, did not come to give us a choice between eternal life and etern eternal damnation. That is not the Jesus of the Bible. But that all should come. That's right. Yeah. All right. works that's right Galatians 5 9 says this a little leaven leavens the whole lump one little sin can destroy the whole teaching one little error one little lie can destroy the whole teaching and I, I mentioned this a couple weeks ago um reading a book called actually it's reading to to me I haven't read it in a while I need to get back to reading it called the uh, 40 49th 49th mystic by Ted Ted Decker is that the guy um, anyway in there one of the person that's portraying Satan says give me long enough and I can torture this big black book into whatever I want it to say and that's, that's what happens. Um, we're told to put on the helmet of armor, the helmet of, of, of truth, of salvation. Why are we told to do that? To protect our minds against the errors of this world. And there's many out there. And they're only going to get worse. You're right. They're only going to get worse. It does. So, right. <clears throat> so, this is why on Sunday mornings I preach truth so that you can hear truth, so that you can understand truth. And Fred, I've read this book. This book is a good book. Um, it's a biblical defense of traditional soteriology. Soteriology is a big name. It just simply means salvation, all right? Um, it's called The Potter's Promise. 
um, and it's by Leighton Flowers. You can't get it at any local bookstore. You have to order it up on, online um, and just look up Leighton Flowers, L-E-I-G-H-T-O-N Flowers. Um, it's called The Potter's Promise. It's a book about Calvinism. Leighton Flowers uh, was a biblical man who went away to college and uh, found Calvinism and studied in Calvinism and then went back to his home church and um, led that church into Calvinism and the Cal and that church split. Um, and then he and, and then he came out of it and now he's he's got a website he's he's got a podcast he's he talks about it. Um, it's not the only thing he talks about, but it's one of the main things. I just want to read you this one thing. Fred brought it to my attention. I gave this to him. I, I've, I would let you borrow my book. I have one that you can borrow if you promise not to write in it. Um, but I have, I have <laughs> written, underlined, and everything else in my book. So anyway, let me just read this, and then we'll pray in close. He says this. He says, um, Wherever we land philosophically, however we must refrain from bringing unbiblical conclusions based upon our finite perceptions to our understanding of God's nature, we must accept the revelation of Scripture. He is holy. He does not take pleasure in sin. Some moral evil does not even enter his holy mind and he genuinely desires all men every individual to come to him and be saved and after each one of those points he's got verses one presumption that we should bring to scripture is that our god is good and he is in no way implicit in the bringing about of moral evil he is a loving god who genuinely, genuinely desires for all to come to repentance so as to be saved. 2 Peter 3, 9. No man will stand before the Father and be able to give the excuse, I was born unloved by my Creator. I was born unchosen and without the hope of salvation. I was born unable to see, hear, or understand God's revelation of himself. No, they will stand wholly and completely without excuse. Because God loved them. God called them to salvation. He revealed himself to them. He provided the means by which their sins would be atoned. No man has any excuse for unbelief. It's deep, it's hard, but it's true. Why... Don't I believe in Calvinism? Because it's not true. My home church, I was telling, I think Danielle, I was telling you this. My home church called a pastor who was a Calvinist. After we left there, um, the pastor that was there when I left, he left, and they brought in another man who was a Calvinist. And I had a friend of mine from high school. I say friend. We were acquaintances. He would email me and say, hey, is this right? And I'd be like, no, why are you studying that? And he'd be like, I'm not. This is what they're preaching from the pulpit. And I said, what pulpit? He said, here at First Baptist. And I said, uh, that's Calvinist. That's not right. He said, I didn't think it was right. And he'd email me again. And he'd say, hey, is this right? And I'd be like, no, what, do you, what is going on? And then finally he called me, and we talked for, I don't know, an hour, hour and a half. And I was like, Ken, this is just not a good thing. And he said, why did they call this pastor? And, and there was a bunch of reasons why they called him. And I said, it's not a good thing. And he said, people are leaving by their droves. When I was there, when we were there, when I grew up, the church had over 500. Um, we were running two services. That was in a long time ago, and um, in 1980s. Um, and then um, over a course of time, it began to dwindle. And different things happened, and different um, people left. And... We were, when we left, there were about 250, 300, um, and we left in, in 2002, January 2002, um, and by 2000, and we were still in Lewisburg, so that would have been, 
at least 10, 12, I think it was about 12 years ago, so like 10 years after that say, 10 years, 2012, um, I don't know how long Rick was there after we left, but uh, the church was down to like 50 people. Um, people just left by the droves because Calvinism is a is a belief that will be popular for a reason, for a season, because it does sound good, and then it will begin to eat its own and drive people out. Um, and um, we've seen it over the years, over and over and over again. It's like a big pendulum that swings from one side to the next. And um, our goal and our purpose, remain in the word, be faithful to the word, be faithful to Jesus and what he says. And take everything in context. It's important that you take everything in the proper context. And I've kept you 15 minutes late, so I'm sorry. But I hope you've learned things. Uh, let's pray. <clears throat> Lord God, thank you for your word. Lord, help us to be true to your word, to be faithful to your word, to live um, our life according to your word by the Holy Spirit of God filling us. And Lord, may we just uh, uh, be witnesses for you. Lord, may we show love, may we show grace, even to those who don't agree with what we believe is truth because Lord they need to see Jesus' true love in us and Lord I thank you for this thank you for your goodness and grace thank you for our church may we remain faithful to you and to your word until you return and Lord we thank you for that thank you for love in Jesus name amen all right See you all. Don't forget, clothing drive begins tomorrow. She starts working about 8-ish. Um, goes all weekend. All right?